we've done that before. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining Coffee Chat. We are really excited to have our friend and partner on today, Susie Ain. She is the president of Peninsula College and fairly new to the community, but already the energy and the direction she's provided, I think, is energized some folks and empowered them. At least that sure is what it looks like from the outside. And so we are just ecstatic, not just to have her on with us this morning, but to have her as a leader within the community. So uh, just a couple quick housekeeping details. If you would please put yourself on mute so we don't inadvertently pick up any background noise and I will do that for you if uh, I see that um, we should be doing that. Um, and uh, also, if you have a question, please either put it in the chat if you'd prefer to do it that way, or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you and you can ask your question of Susie. So with that, Susie does have some slides today for us and um, it's going to present on uh, the college's behalf. So again, thank you, Susie, for joining us. Take it away. Thanks, Colleen. Um, before I get started my presentation, I just want to do a shout out to a few folks in the room. Uh, Dr. Mike Maxwell is one of Peninsula College's trustees. He wears so many hats in the community. And we're really grateful to have him as part of Peninsula College. Um, and we have also a host of Peninsula College employees in the room who are um, my support team. So if any question comes up, I don't know the answer to, I'm going to phone a friend and tag one of them. So thanks for being here. Um, two other personal notes, I'm excited to see Nancy and Margarita here from PNNL. Team of PC folks are headed in there this afternoon. I can't wait to see your facility and uh, start more partnerships with the college. And then a personal note, hi, Calvin. It's great to see you. I haven't seen you in person in probably a decade. So it's gonna be great to work with you again. I know everyone's thrilled to have you in the community. All right, with that, I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen. I did a practice yesterday. We'll see how this goes. There we go. Are you seeing my slides? Are you seeing it in demonstration mode? Yes, we sure okay. are. Okay, perfect, great. So I'll go ahead and get started. So um, a few uh, uh, facts and figures about the college. You might not know some uh, some basics about us. So we are primarily a younger institution <clears throat> serving folks right out of high school under age 20. We have 60%, almost 60% of our students are female. This is honestly a bit of a disturbing trend, not only at PC, but across the whole country. Um, I just did a presentation to Squim Rotary about where are the men, where are the boys in higher education? It is a national dilemma that's very worrisome because they're also not in the workforce and they're not in the military. Um, I think they're in their parents' basements playing video games. So uh, it's, a, it's a worry uh, society-wise. 32% um, of our students are of color. 14% of first generation means that they, um, their parent, one or more parent did not complete um, a two-year degree. A little over 3% are veterans, 3% are international, and 10% are working while attending class. Um, this is a number, um, likely we need to update. It probably came from the pandemic, and I'm sure more are working these days. So here's some of our highest enrolled in pro programs. So we are about 50-50 transfer and professional technical. Um, transfer is either traditional two-year general education courses that, um, that universities accept. Um, our most uh, popular professional technical program is nursing. The third most popular is interesting, this is family life. So we have a really, really robust early childhood development center otherwise known as a child care center, but we do way more than just child care. We actually teach these little kids, uh, but we also require the parents to take parenting classes if their kids are in our childhood development center. Unfortunately, addiction studies is a very highly enrolled program. There are a tremendous number of jobs in our community in this field, um, and I'll share a little bit more about how, the ways we're looking to expand that program. 
Our associate in science is another really popular transfer degree, specifically if students know they want to go into a STEM field. Um, welding is ridiculously popular, and these students go and make a ton of money right here in Clallam and Jefferson County. Um, and then basic education for adults. These are our students over 18 years old who are either learning English as a second language, or they're doing some catch up work with their high school diploma, um, getting up to college level in math and English. And we do a really great job and we're gonna do even better um, getting those students into college certificates and degrees. So this is a slide I'm not gonna dwell on, but we've had 10 years of enrollment decline. And we're going to turn that around. So um, this is what's new at PC and uh, some really, really exciting things have been in um, development or in practice this year and even more coming soon. So I think Brian Kenidal is on the call today. Um, he's been doing a great job partnering with businesses to bring to them the job skills program. This is a statewide grant uh, where employers can work with us on a customized training to upskill your current workers. One of the most popular um, ways that employers take advantage of this is on leadership skills. So if you have folks who are new to management or maybe need a refining of their skills in um, uh, human relations and how to supervise and support people, how to do meaningful performance reviews, that kind of thing. Um, but we can also do technical training as well. We can do it on site um, at your facility. So uh, Brian can put his information in the chat um, and um, encourage all employees to contact him to, and he'll hold your hand as we walk through the complicated, semi-complicated state process, but Brian's a pro at it. And so McKinley and Bricks have taken advantage of this just in the last few months. We have uh, quite a few new programs that have started this year. We have a photography certificate um, and it offers drone technology. Um, you probably read in the paper, we're bringing the media tech certificate in partnership with Field Arts and Events Hall. Um, we have a tribal emergency management certificate, a virtual office assistant certificate, and both of those can be completely um, uh, completed fully online. We have an EV, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're bringing an EV component um, in uh, auto repair. Um, the bookkeeping certificate got a lot of publicity. That's the one we partnered with EDC um, and Grace Harbor College, that one's up and running. Um, and this fall, we also started a paralegal associates degree. And all of those are in direct demand um, uh, and feedback from our local employers and, and the curriculum customized by them. Super excited to announce one that's coming very soon. This coming fall will be the first professional technical program in Forks, and that will be a natural resources certificate. A one-year program will eventually grow it into a two-year degree the employers out there are ridiculously excited to hire our graduates. They really wanted a one year certificate. They wanted to get these graduates out into the workforce as fast as possible. And there's a ton more that are in the works. I'm going to run through the list um, with the caveat that please don't hold me to any exact timelines on when they're going to launch, except the EV. Uh, I know the EV program and I know the natural resources program. We're, we're we're on really solid ground to start those in the fall. The others require a significant amount of um, logistical issues and external approving bodies. So the timeline um, is not necessarily on our um, in complete control of our own. But ones that we're actively pursuing are the marine technology. We want to do this kind of combination of we do welding. We want to add electronics. And then we also want to add the finishing. So taking like our construction trades program um, and turning, modifying it so students learn kind of the, how to create the inside furnishings of the boat in like the galley, for example. I mentioned the media tech certificate that'll be starting, I think this spring, um, Mia can correct me on that, um, where students will actually learn hands-on at a field, field arts and events hall on their equipment and then take their um, lecture classes here on campus. Others that are in the works, a uh, degree in software development, 
a degree mm -hmm. in dental hygiene, a degree in veterinary techno technician, um, one that's just breaking news that we're getting started as a nursing assistant certificate at our Port Townsend campus, and one that's also just brand new um, in the works happening this week are, are parenting classes at the Jamestown Healing Clinic. So uh, talk a little bit about our Bachelors of Applied Science. So Peninsula College was one of the first four community colleges in the state to offer an applied bachelor's degree. In fact, I, I did my dissertation on Peninsula College and the three other colleges that offered this bachelor's degree. Ours is in business management. Um, but we have a tremendous opportunity to, to expand that degree and grow new ones. So um, I know that Tanya Knight is in the room. Um, she's super busy um, developing concentrations embedded in our business degree. So we could do a concentration in tribal management, human resources, computer science. In fact, Tanya did a survey of current students and students that have graduated within four years. Um, within two days, we got a ridiculously high response rate and um, really, really strong feedback from even, even more concentrations than are on this list. Um, so we'll be looking to see how many of those we can start this fall and, and subsequent quarters after that. I mentioned a couple minutes ago that we are that our addiction studies program is one of our most popular professional technical programs. Right now, that is a two-year uh, what we call a terminal degree. There's no educational pathway after that. But we're going to be able to build on that and give our students the opportunity for our bachelor's in behavioral health to be able to increase their salary earning potential in the community. And it's also really exciting because it will transfer to universities that offer the master's in social work. So a game changer for a student who currently can only get an associate's degree is going to be able to go on and get a master's. And unfortunately, those jobs are in huge demand in our community. One that is a, a heavy lift to get off the ground, but it will be coming in the future is K through eight education. We hear particularly from our rural school districts that they have a very hard time recruiting teachers and they love to hire teachers who are locally grown. And so we wanna be able to offer um, the ability to become an elementary um, or middle school teacher um, right here at Peninsula College. So Susie, can yeah. I ask a question about that? You mentioned that it will be particularly hard to get off the ground. Why is that? Um, so we have to partner with the Public Education School Board. They are essentially an external accrediting body. They only meet twice a year and their application and review process is extremely rigorous, rightly so, because we wanna make sure that we put high quality teachers in the classroom, um, but putting our timeline against their very, very, very restrictive timeline where they only have two meetings a year makes it so if our report's not ready, we're six months down the road or a year down the road. So mm -hmm. that's the reason for the delay. So I saw in the chat too, a question that what's the difference between BA and BAS? Yeah. Uh, BAS, Bachelors of Applied Science, but then BA, Yep. So BA is Bachelor of Arts and okay. BAS is Bachelor of Applied Science. So in Washington State, community and technical colleges are only legislatively authorized to offer the Bachelor of Applied Science. We could not offer a Bachelor's of Science or a Bachelor of Arts. Those are reserved for the universities. When we when we got permission in 2005 to offer applied science bachelor's of applied science degrees, it was specifically because it's meeting a niche that the universities are not meeting. So you'll never see the community colleges offer a bachelor of arts in philosophy or a bachelor's of science in engineering. Um, those are specifically in university territory. Um, but these are um, the list here are ones where the university is either not doing them at all or not doing them at a capacity that's meeting the workforce needs. So um, if I can, I don't mean to bump into your presentation here, but um, so the bachelors of applied science in business with a computer science management concentration. How, as an example with that one, how did you determine that that is needed and what kind of jobs would 
uh, people will be filling within the community once they get that degree. Yeah. So um, starting a bachelor's of applied science requires a really rigorous application process through the state board for community and technical colleges. We have to do two separate applications a couple of months apart. The first one is the statement of need where we show the state that we have a local demand for a job in our local community. And it's a combination of um, survey results from employers and survey results from current and past students. Um, and then we have to apply for the actual program proposal to show what kind of curriculum we're gonna teach. There's a little bit, more, there's a lot more flexibility in these concentrations because the state has already approved the core bachelors of a, a applied business management. We can offer concentrations much more flexibly as they meet the needs of our local communities. So Tanya Knight, who's in the audience, um, has interviewed employers and students um, to gain their uh, interest in um, a, a degree like this. They could work locally working anywhere from um at a i mean i'm omc and known and other large employers who are trying to manage it systems um as well as with um, the it industry um moving uh, significantly into remote operations this could also be a job that could be done um remotely from here um, and working mm -hmm. anywhere in the world got it thank you yeah so we are very proud to uh, be able to partner with our six federally recognized tribes in the area. Um, and I know Cheryl Crane is in the room and she and her team have worked really hard to develop uh, traditional college, uh, traditional language courses that meet college language uh, transferability to universities. Um, this was done at the request of tribes um, and, and the classes are taught collaboratively with tribal members. So we current we started with Clown Squallum language. Um, we so we have six classes um, there. We have three Macaw classes um, with three more coming, two Quileute language classes with four more coming. So we'll be able to offer the full two-year suite of language classes um, for these um, for our tribes. Uh, when we first kicked off the Clown Squallum courses, they were um, extremely highly enrolled and enrolled with people living all across the country, people mm -hmm. who are from here, but maybe have moved away and they want a connection to home. Um, we're offering the Quileute language at the tribal school in La Push, And um, it is a um, really meaningful opportunity where you have uh, young students, working age adult students and elders all in the classroom at the same time. And from what we've heard, a lot of really great shared learning and cultural exchanges happening in those classrooms. Do you have many folks that are not tribal members that want to just, you know, learn more about the culture? There are a few, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's not our highest enrolled area, but it, we do have, we do have some students who have, uh, at it, uh, join the classes, definitely. But it's really extremely popular with tribal members and communities across the country. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, and Cheryl's also been working on an integrated indigenous pathway. So as I mentioned earlier in my slides, our two-year transfer degree is very, very popular. It's, it's kind of the core of what we have done for a really long time. What Cheryl and her team are doing is creating one with contextualized indigenous courses. So this is your DTA, your direct transfer agreement, but it infuses indigenous ways of knowing and pedagogy. So an uh, indigenous student can have their um, two-year degree contextualized in their way of knowing. And the other thing I love about it is these are just, these are courses listed in our catalog you know, a history class, a humanities class, a social science class. So a non-native student can enroll for these in those classes as well. And they're strongly encouraged to, to learn about the cultures and the ways of knowing from an indigenous way of knowing, and they're getting their to your um, transferable credits at the same time. So it's a really nice way to um, take all of the what might be isolated and expand it throughout a traditional model of a two-year transfer degree. And these, um, we, uh, 
we have indigenous um, faculty teaching, we have indigenous and non-indigenous faculty um, teaching courses and they're infusing indigenous materials and pedagogy, literally ranging from botany to literature and everything in between. So we're really trying to create a community of belonging for our indigenous students. We have 5% of our students are indigenous. I have a personal goal of raising that to 10%. I personally think that's very doable. Um, and if we reach that 10% level, we're going to be able to apply for a unique designation at the Department of Education at the federal level. Um, similar, you might have heard of a Hispanic serving institution. This would be a tribal serving institution, and we would be eligible for uh, a unique set of funding opportunities that most colleges would not be eligible for. So we can do even more to support our Native students. That's really cool. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you to Cheryl and her team. Yeah, great job, Cheryl. Um, and then finally, um, so our community education um, courses came back about I, uh, two years ago, um, and they are very popular. And they are, these are your non-credit classes in the hobby range from like felting and learning how to cook and uh uh, garden and that kind of thing. But then there's also some technical courses, particularly for incumbent workers, um, learning how to uh, do grant writing, earning an IBM badge um, in blockchain, cybersecurity, and artificial intelligence. So we're trying to stay up on the cutting edge of what some of those certificates could be that could help someone upskill in their current job. Hmm. And then um, I'm going to stop sharing and then also share just verbally um, something that happened. Well, as Mia said, it's been a super cool week at Peninsula College. So um, two highlights that um, are really uh, groundbreaking for us. So I had this uh, lofty vision of um, a center on campus that is a one stop for our most at risk students to be able to bring them wraparound support services. So our students are no different than any other um, resident, resident who's struggling with housing, transportation, domestic violence, food insecurity, uh, needing legal support, uh, you know, life uh, issues. And what we know is when we refer students to a local agency in the community, they often um, don't make it there for a variety of reasons and they don't necessarily make it back to the college. And so we thought if we could provide those wraparound support services here in a place that they already know, they're already comfortable with, they're gonna be much more inclined to take advantage of those support services and most importantly, stay in school and complete their degree, which is gonna get them on the pathway to self-sufficiency. So uh, Celeste Schoenthaler, the Executive Director of Olympic Community of Health, um, single-handedly pulled together this meeting earlier this week with over 20 uh, community agencies and they all uh, they my team laid out a really compelling case for our clients or your students and let's find a way to work together to support them and the response was totally inspiring um, every single one of them said yes um uh Serenity House is on campus tomorrow as a result. Um, I mean, it was just like immediate action. And I have no doubt we're going to be able to create a center um, right here staffed by our local community resources. Um, with the thought being that our students are like this close to self-sufficiency. And if our community can support them, that's going to free up resources to be able to help folks who aren't at Peninsula College yet and get them to college. So it's really equi leading with equity at the forefront, because we used to say back in the old days, we used to say, well, get all your life issues figured out first. And then once you have all your life wrapped up with a pretty bow, then you can come to college. And fortunately, we know better now. And we realize that that's not reality because college is going to be the thing that gets you out of that cycle. So how do we infuse support services and education at the same time? so that you can get a stable life and faster because you're gonna be able to earn a livable wage at the end of the day. So that was just um, Monday and we're all still buzzing from it. And uh, it's the, this community is amazing. This community just comes with a spirit of yes and let's figure it out. And um, 
what I know personally from work on, working on the I-5 corridor my whole career and what I've learned from other people in the room is um, it's not like that everywhere and Clallam County in particular is a very special place and there's just so much potential in what we can do and building off of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other cool thing we had was just yesterday, um, that same room, but fill, also filled, but filled with healthcare providers. Um, so we brought in um, the director of the Center of Excellence for Allied Health, who's a statewide resource for the community and technical colleges. And he led a couple hour long conversation with healthcare providers about what are their needs. So how can Peninsula College um, pivot and partner to meet their needs. And another theme that came out of that was just all the significant partnerships that we already have with healthcare and the college. And Dan made an, a similar comment that those partnerships don't happen in other communities to the extent they do here. And we know that healthcare is gonna see massive changes in the next five to 10 years. And so is education. So maybe we can grow together um, and change together so that we can kind of close some of those gaps for um, educational pathways and workforce opportunities. So can you share a little more color about that last statement? We know that healthcare and education are going to change dramatically in the next five to 10 years. What, how, how do you mean? Okay, so I'll talk about education. I might tap Mike for healthcare, but um, for education. So um, we know even before the pandemic, um, that young people are less and less inclined to go um, get a, a, a two-year or a four-year degree and just kind of bet on the come that a job might be waiting for them. They're very nervous about racking up debt and they want more instant gratification. So they want to be able to convince employers that they have innate skills or skills they can learn on YouTube and apply them tomorrow in the job. And they might not be wrong <laughs> because the employers are so desperate for employees. We're hearing um, like this natural resources certificate. So me and I were talking like natural resources industry used to be very, very four year centric. Like you needed a bachelor's or a master's before they'd even talk to you. And now they're saying, how fast can you get them to us one year or less and we'll hire them and we'll train them on the job. So I don't see that changing anytime soon with the workforce demand and with the mindset of young people where they're um, they don't they don't want to just sit in a classroom for two or four or six years. They want to go out and they want to apply what they know and they want to learn on the job. So that's on us to adapt our educational model to be able to chunk what, what we call chunking up the credits. So marine manufacturing, take one or two quarters of welding, one or two quarters of electronics, one or two quarters of the, the wood furnishings and go and take those out in the workforce. And then what we'll see down the road is um, we hope they come back. We hope they come back with their employer's support because we think at some point they're going to max out their on the job learning capability a point employers aren't going to have the capacity to do that higher level on the job training so then we've got to figure out what those employer college relationships look like whether we do that training on their site or in the evenings or how can we be flexible to allow the workforce the employers to keep their employees but also continue to get them upskilled so that's just one example of how education is changing, but with technology, um, with uh, people having fewer babies, it means we've got uh, fewer traditional 18-year-olds graduating and coming to college, and yet we have a whole host of 21 and older who have not had advantage of education, and we've got to get them some credentials so that they can fill those highly skilled jobs, because you can't do much with a high school diploma anymore in our highly advanced Feel, uh, economy. Mm -hmm. So that's just education. Um, and Mike, can I tap you for a two minute summary on all the changes in healthcare? Sure. In two minutes, we'll, we'll get, we'll, we'll cover it all. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll actually, I'll use part of that two minutes just while I got the mic, just to uh, give a shout out to Susie. I mean, it's pretty clear to uh, I think everyone on, on the call that, you know, one of the best things we did as a board of trustees was, was select Susie as the next president. I mean, she's, she's brought such great energy and it's palpable. And uh, we we had that sense in the interviews that she would be that person. And it's just so nice to see that she is. And, and we're going to really be a better place uh, as a college and as a community because of it. So 
Uh, keep up the great work, Susie. So now healthcare in one minute. <clears throat> um, the uh, really uh, healthcare delivery uh, revolves around really three things. It's it's the science and, and what we understand is best best practice get guided by evidence-based science. There's also the the people, you know, the expectations of the people, the patients that, that we're, we're serving and the workforce that we have to, uh, to do it with. And all three of those things are changing. The science is changing every day. Uh, the uh, people's expectations, uh, uh, Susie mentioned, uh, you know, uh, instant gratification. We are, we are in the midst of people wanting everything now and, you know, when they want it, how they want it. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it really has a lot more telehealth, a lot more online resources for uh, for, uh, for health information, uh, correct or not. Uh, so that's having a big influence uh, on on how uh, care is delivered. And then really the workforce, <clears throat> as, as Susie mentioned, there's just fewer and fewer people uh, uh, in the workforce now. They've left in droves, and uh, there may be some glimmers to try and attract people back, but they're coming back with different expectations about and tolerances for what you know uh, what they expect from the job and what they'll do and that changes what we have who we have to available to deliver the, uh, that care at, at all levels and uh, so that that uh, I, I, it would take a, another hour to talk about th those impacts but really that's those are the three high levels uh, uh, moving parts that will change what healthcare care delivery looks like and the college plays a big uh, uh, part in how we address that and the aging um, population, there aren't going to be enough people to take care of us when we get old, unless we figure out a different model. That's mm. right. Mm. So so I, old. Huh? Yeah, I know. Sorry, <laughs> I'm retiring here, so I'm uh, I got my sights on it. <laughs> um, I just saw Matt's uh, comment in the chat: the 92 percent of jobs require technology, AI training, and aptitude. Yeah, and and so we have to figure out how to teach that differently. You can't go and get a two-year technical degree on top of whatever else. We have to figure out how to infuse it. So I think I, uh, my comments are, number one is, I could not be more happy to have you in the chair that you're in and uh, all the energy and, and uh, enlightenment you're bringing. Um, but it seems like you're trained, like rural communities used to be at a disadvantage because we weren't in the epicenter, you know, or close to the, the center of things. But now with COVID and everything else, you, you, most of your or a lot of your courses are online. People are used to online and we're going to be working remotely, can, you know, ongoing. So it seems like you're aligning I mean, it, it feels like the rural community won't be at a disadvantage near as much, particularly with the type of training you're doing, making sure everybody can take classes and are and are good at at use of technology. It, it, uh, do you, do you see that rural communities will catch up and be equal to um, you know employment wise and training wise and all that? Uh, it seems it seems like it's a great equalizer now that with uh, technology and remote learning. I think so. I mean, I think, you know, the, um, just the fact that we're expanding in the software development realm, I mean, that's a really good example where most of those jobs are online now. Yeah. So I'm happy to answer questions. I see James says um, uh, environmental remediation and GIS. Um, I think those are also on Mia's radar. I'm seeing her head nod. Do you want to comment on that, Mia? Mia's our, Dr. Mia Boster is our Dean of Workforce Education. Thanks, Susie. Yes, uh, so we have a GIS at mapping class uh, as part of the curriculum. And we have, um, we just had a really good conversation with our advisory committee last week because we're finalizing the parts of the certificate. And it, that did come up, it's about remediation, not just, you know, they wanted to focus on restoration. And um, so that is definitely in the program. And we're getting the website ready to go. We can share that out once it's online and everyone can see the details of the program. Rebecca asked, is broadband an issue for any students? Yes, it absolutely is. So um, some of the, the it work that we still need to do is figure out um, how to get access in our most rural communities. So our district is very challenging in that we run from the corners of um, uh, the corners of the country, <laughs> um, out you know past Forks and and um, Cape Flattery to um, 
Quilcine and Chimicum and a lot of folks, a lot of folks in rural areas that don't have technology. One of the areas that we're exploring is this concept called high flex. So high flex came mostly out of the pandemic. A few colleges were doing it before that, but it's the idea that students can be face to face or online. And on any given day, you could come to class if you're able to, or you can tune in online. It requires an extremely adept faculty member to do a dance, <laughs> to create a meaningful learning opportunity in the classroom and a meaningful learning opportunity online. So I don't want to um, sugarcoat that at all. It's, there are some faculty can pull it off really, really well, and others struggle with it. And it, um, but for example, you know, we've got libraries and we have schools in these rural areas. So could we offer a high flex opportunity where maybe the face to face opportunity is in Port Angeles, but maybe there's an opportunity to tune in remotely at your library or at your school. And so partnering with those entities to try to bring that education more local so they don't have to rely on broadband um, at their home. Mm -hmm. um, so Sean, HVAC, electrical, um, so HVAC is challenging because that is primarily, that, that area is primarily owned by the labor unions um, with apprentices, apprenticeships. And I know that's a whole nother conversation we don't have time to get into today. Um, and apprenticeships are very challenging in a rural environment, um, but the jobs that are there are union jobs. And so they typically require the apprenticeship to get the union jobs. Um, we we're, we are going to offer electronics, which is different than electrician, um, but we're going to offer that. And construction trades is already a program that we have, and we're going to expand on it specifically with a maritime lens. Mm -hmm. So it costs a lot to create a new program. I know if you do the, um, the governor's strategic funding, you can get a, a one-off kind of program for a business that's growing. But what about it, if it's fairly general, you know, and, and you are trying to create a certificate or a program, what, what's the minimum number of students you need? What's that threshold level for it to pencil out for Peninsula College? Um, I'll say it varies. <laughs> um, Mia, do you want to expand on it? It really varies depending on the program. Right. And, and so to give you a comparison, we have a criminal justice program that's offered entirely online and there's no equipment compared to welding that has equipment consumables. You know, we try to have, you know, we've always had a traditional target of 12 to 15 students per class in prof tech, but that can vary. Okay. I was reading Mary's comment in the chat. Um, we uh, correct me if I'm wrong, team, but I think we have the senior citizen waiver. Is that correct? Yes. The audit. Yes. Yeah. Audit, yes. So senior citizens can audit any of our classes um, mm -hmm. at either no cost or very low cost. Cheryl, it is. It's, so it's for um, Washington State residents age 60 and over, and they pay uh, only the fees associated, not the tuition. So a five credit, and th this is for the the four credit. FOR credit um, courses um, for a five credit course, which is our typical structure, uh, it's about $60, $65 or so to audit those as a senior audit. Um, there was also a question about the other types of courses offered in community education, and there are some more academic uh, academic topics that have just started being offered. For example, our um, uh, Matt, Dr. Matt Torrey, um, our professor of uh, English, um, is in addition to teaching his composition and literature classes through arts and sciences, he's also teaching a community ed course right now. Uh, he recently published a book on women in the 1920s and representations in literature, and so he's teaching that through community ed. So we're trying to see if we can get those relaunched, reinvigorated, and we're getting a lot of uh, really positive feedback from the community. So I do see that the community ed folks will be starting to build more of those classes that would be a either a parallel to the academic courses or maybe even an on-ramp to some academic courses. Thank you. I don't think I formally introduced Dr. Shell Crane, who's our Dean of um, Transfer in Arts and Sciences. 
Um, so Paula Hunt is in the room and I knew she would quiz me, so I'm ready for you. <laughs> so um, she's asking about our capital budget request that's in front of the legislature right now. So um, the community and technical colleges, there's 34 of us in the state, and we work together on our legislative package of requests to go to the state. We don't do individual um, one-off requests. So we together out of all 34 colleges, we have a huge capital budget request. Um, a big portion of that is what we call minor works. Minor works are not sexy, but they keep the lights on and they keep the heat running. So um, one of the unique things that we did as a community college system this year was we're asking specifically for $2 million for every college for what we call program improvements. Um, we had to submit to the state at, ahead of time what we as Peninsula College would do with that $2 million. So um, there's two things we would do with it that are absolutely essential. So, and I'm learning all about this um, for the first time, but there's something called electricity switch gears, which some folks in the room probably know a lot more about than I do, but they keep the lights on <laughs> at the end of the day. And our switch gears in our welding and auto repair building are over 50 years old and they're about to fail. And if they fail, uh, we won't be able to offer uh, welding and auto repair and construction trades. So uh, part of that $2 million would go to replace those. The other thing it would do is our software that runs our HVAC system across the whole campus um, has failed and um, the software has expired. So we need a, to purchase a new software and a new ongoing license. Um, so, and that affects every classroom and building across campus. So what we're doing now is patching it with a lot of manpower to keep the HVAC running in each separate system. We used to have a software that would just automatically manage it for all of our buildings. So I've made it very clear to Representative Theringer that this is not just extra nice to have. These are core to keep. Yeah, there you go. Unsexy but necessary is what Paula said. Um, they are core. They are not just um, uh, icing on the cake to make our programs even better. Mm -hmm. I think there were some other questions on there. Has there been interest in hosting residential energy DIY workshops? Um, is, I don't know if Camilla's in the room or if any of my team can focus on that. We do have, uh, uh, Camilla Rico is our director of um, continuing education, and I know she's always um, exploring new opportunities, so we can pass that on to her as a suggestion. It's a good one. Susie, I, I was asking, uh, how do how do you determine uh, is there a, a certain process that I mean I see all these amazing you know wonderful programs you're uh, uh, implementing or producing is there a certain process by which you go about uh, to evaluate uh, whether to do that or not is it based on a survey of need is it based on uh, the county's need or uh, or the state uh, how, and how many people do you need and how long does a program have to stay once you develop it does it have to can you switch them out quickly and or, or is anyway i'm just not sure okay. how that works. sure so we are highly regulated by the state and our, this particularly the state board for community and technical colleges so anytime we're going to go start a professional technical program uh, we have to prove to the state that there is a job demand right here in our local service area okay um, that makes it challenging sometimes they don't it's really hard to capture entrepreneurialism for any for example that's not a thing that they measure um <laughs> Sometimes we can get around it by showing student demand, but they really look at the employment security data um, and the Department of Labor statistics to show where the job demand is. Um, so that's the process we go through to start a program. Mia's a pro at it. There's a, there's a, and we, we also have to work with local employers. They, we have to show, they actually have to sign a form that says they vetted our program, they have signed on that it's needed and that the higher hire our graduates. Um, then we can sunset a program. Um, that's hard to do. Um, it typically involves laying off a faculty member. Um, we, we don't do it lightly, um, but sometimes we have to do it. When I was at Lake Washington Institute of Technology, I had to do it way too often um, because the workforce was changing and Kirkland no longer hires a bunch of mechanics and welders and elect 
electronic folks, they do IT. So we had to really adjust a lot of those programs. So it's not a fast process, um, but we've done it. Um, a few years ago, PC closed its auto repair program because it wasn't keeping par with modern technology. So we sunsetted it and now we're bringing it back with an electric vehicle component. So we try to, um, we try to follow those workforce demands, but we're a large bureaucracy with limited funding. And so sometimes we can't be as responsive as we wish we could. We couldn't just turn on EV on a dime, for example. It took a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great to know. You mean so, demand. Susie, um, there, people have different type of learning styles. And especially with online learning now, there are that is difficult for some people to absorb information that way. Maybe they're not auditory learners. Maybe how how has PC included. been able how has PC been able to adapt to different people's learning styles in this online environment? Yeah, I think that's really where HyFlex comes in. So um, we know some people really thrive in an online environment and others just flat out struggle. We know that students just stopped going to college during the pandemic because they knew that they were not going to succeed taking really hard classes or classes that they struggle with in an online environment. Um, so we have 60% um, of our classes are now face to face. Um, and um, we have many that are high flex and hopefully more to come so that we can figure out where that balance is. As a small, what I always call low funded college, we get um, proportionally compared to our peers in the state, we, we get very little money, relatively speaking, from the state. So we can't offer a class in Forks for three students with a faculty member and a separate class in Port Townsend with three students and a faculty member. So we have to figure out a way to do it efficiently, but provide face-to-face -face opportunities as often as possible. So why, why yeah. do we get relatively low funding relative to other areas in the state? Um, so we have what's called an allocation model for every for the for the system, and it's a very complex um, algorithm that gets cre created and tweaked every eight to ten years in our system. And the last time it was done was in twenty the four thir thirteen. Um, actually, Tom Keegan who used to be here, led it when he was at Skagit Valley College. And one of the things that goes in the allocation model is what's the base amount that every single college needs to keep the lights on and offer basic education? Um, I, that number is too low. <laughs> um, and I have, I've worked at, this is my fifth college. Um, when I worked at Pierce College, they were rich. <laughs> they were so rich compared to some of the low funded smaller colleges. So um, we're gonna be looking at it again as a system starting in July and I'm already lobbying to get on that task force. So I can be a voice for small rural, small colleges in, in particular are really at a disadvantage in our community college system. And I think you said our college has the lowest enrollment of all the 34 community and technical colleges. Is that right? We're it's the smallest. And we're it the has second, we're the second, we're the second smallest in the state okay. after Grace Harbor College. The two of us jockey back and forth for the smallest. Okay. And I saw that. So, you know, you did say enrollments are declining over the last 10 years. And just looking at the graph, I noticed that it looked like it dropped about 25% from when COVID hit, but now it's a bit on an upswing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, offering new programs is so important. Growing out of, um, of a decline is so important. And that mindset not being cut, 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 but, you know, figure out what's needed and grow. And I see that appears to be your philosophy, but how are you going to be able to balance that? And, and, you know, I guess it's, it's, you're just trying to provide better programs or more relevant programs and get the marketing out there. And is that kind of your approach and how has that worked so far? Yeah, so that's the my mantra to the college communities. We have to grow our way out of this. We're, we can't cut our way. There is no more cutting that can be done. Um, I, I did this at Lake Washington, so I've seen it work. Um, and we're following the same model, which is just rapid um, 
production of new instructional programs. Our team is phenomenal. Um, they're hungry, they're ready to go. Um, and that's why that I was able to show that slide of so, so many programs because the demand is there and they're just ready to go. I think Mia can write a state application in her sleep at this point. Um, and so um, we're doing active fundraising um, to raise money to put new equipment in these new labs. Um, so we need to have an electric vehicle donated to us so we can offer electric vehicle program. Um, you know, so we're looking at all different funding sources. Um, um, we, 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 we just have to grow. I'm also um, really excited to empower our marketing team with um, the charge to create new edgy fun um, advertisements. So watch that coming um, this spring. Um, we're going to break out of the traditional boring educational advertising model and we're going to try to capture people's attention in a new way. Um, so we're trying to do all the things because um, that, that, that graph is not sustainable. We're, we have to do things differently. Mm -hmm. I see Bill has his hand up and Bill, before you speak, I, I want to say thank you to you. Um, Susie had talked about the importance of the employment security department's processes, determining what careers and fields are in demand. And Bill was instrumental in setting up a meeting with the commissioner of the employment security department for us to talk about, hey, your process is wildly inaccurate. <laughs> that provides wildly inaccurate results. And can we, you know, so anyway, thank you, Bill. And Bill is the um, is the executive director of our region's Workforce Development Council, which is the Olympic Workforce Development Council, which is a, it, which actually is a subset of Kitsap County government for us, but he has just been a terrific partner. Um, and so uh, helping, us in all of our workforce needs. So go ahead, Bill. Well, thank you. That's very kind, Colleen. I, and I'm excited about the work we're doing with Susie and her team. I am thrilled about JSP, um, that we are finally getting on that track. You know, so few businesses are really aware of this opportunity, I think, of of the job skills program and, and how that could so benefit them. And then of course, open new opportunities for new workers into the field as well. So we're excited by that. You talked a little bit about work study, I think, uh, or a little bit about on the job training and stuff. Where are the dollars coming for that? That's one of our big things is to usually try and partner on a, where we'll, we will uh, pay for the uh, the on-the-job training component, will we see an educational component there to kind of help our students together? But I'm kind of wondering, do you have other resources for that? Or, um, yeah, that would be that. And then just the second part about, you're right, these programs that you're pointing to are very, very expensive. And so how is the resource development kind of activity around that? Um, because I the things that were listed there, the hygienist, obviously, program, which is such a huge demand, we know, Others, which will bring great, great jobs, good jobs, as we describe them, to self-sustaining wages. But um, as you know, I mean, technology changes in these programs so rapidly in some, and it's very hard for a school, especially a peninsula size, to be able to continue to, you know, all that equipment and resources. So kind of what's the plan with that? Thank you. I'll answer the last part first. Um, it's extremely challenging. It, it's challenging at every community college. Like I said, I used to work at a technical college where every single program we offered was expensive. Um, and so it, we're, we're not funded that way. We need more conversations with our legislators over time to change the way community colleges are funded. We need the voice of employers at the table to advocate on our behalf. Um, so we don't have a funding model for on-the-job training. Um, if it's an internship, for example, students sign up for a five credit class and they take an internship. So we do get the tuition money from that. But if we're really going to do a transformative model where students are doing much more on the job training than they're doing now, we're, we're going to need a different funding model. Um, so all of that's just going to have to change as a society, as a support for community colleges. We get a tremendous amount of support from the legislature, they understand the workforce role that community colleges play. So there's never enough money to go around, but we don't really have to fight that fight with our legislators um, with just why we're important. Um, so 
we are actively raising money and we look to our local community to support those programs. Um, this community is very supportive of our professional technical programs. Um, folks, whether whether it's an employer or just somebody that wants to support PropTech students, they donate a lot of money to us and we're super grateful for them. We couldn't do it without them. We also are really good at applying for competitive grants from the state um, for workforce education funding. Um, so we have, for example, Mia gets um, a bunch of money directed to our nursing program every single year so we can keep that equipment up and running because one mechanized um, mannequin is a hundred thousand dollars and wow. the upkeep of that is insanely expensive and we don't have a um, we're not funded to keep all of those going so we have to look to our local community and, and donors can you um susie kind of compare and contrast the difference um, Peninsula College versus the other colleges you've worked with, worked at in the state. <laughs> um, Obviously it's smaller. Yeah. And there's no overlap, which is really a luxury, right? Yes. Because in other areas of the state, you're competing. You, two oh. different, sometimes three or four colleges serve a geography. So yeah. uh, I would think that would be really nice. Yeah, it's a huge, it's it's night and day. It really is night and day. We are the college, so we're it. So employers look to us. Um, we directly reply to what their needs are. Um, I spent 23 years on the I-5 corridor, um, never had that luxury um, where it's really hard to get the attention of an employer on I-5 because mm -hmm. there's so much and, and really the attention of anybody like that wraparound support services meeting that we had on Monday and the healthcare meeting that we had Tuesday, those meetings do not happen on the other side of the water. Um, mm. They just simply don't. And there's too much noise, too much distraction, too many other priorities where one community college couldn't garner that much attention from any one um, cause or entity. So um, that part is, is just, it just, for me, it makes my job so much more meaningful because we can actually affect change right here in our local community. I felt for so many years, like I was just beating my head up against a wall, working in the larger urban area where you do, you have a community college here and another one, five miles down the road and another one, five miles down the road, I'm exaggerating, but they're not that far apart. Um, and so there's just a lot of competition and I don't think you can make as much impact in a local community where here our employers look to us, our wraparound support service agencies look to us and we um, do everything we can to meet those local needs. There's a lot of uh, beauty and efficiency in that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can, we can help more people. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Um, so James wrote, how can individuals get involved, I guess, um, as volunteers, I guess, uh, potentially? James, yeah, James, I'll just put my email address in chat and um, we can talk and figure out All what, right. where you want to put your energies. We'd love to partner. Well, so um, I, I want to end on saying thank you so much to Susie and welcome, welcome, welcome. It's just fabulous to have you on the Olympic Peninsula serving Clallam and Jefferson counties. Um, and I wanna put a quick plug out on Monday at 1 p.m. The state representatives from the Washington State Department of Commerce are gonna be here in Port Angeles um, for something called an ICAP launch. That's the Innovation Cluster Acceleration Program launch. So it is a, there are different clusters around the state that bring together um, education and technology, small businesses, larger businesses to, you know, you think the most famous would be Silicon Valley, right? Uh, that one was major, but they are hoping to launch um, potentially a cluster around uh, industry 
in Port Angeles, we are going to apply. And so it's very early stages. We're not identifying the industry as of yet, but we are going to be talking about their program. And um, if you're interested, please email me um, and I can send you the link or you can go to ICAP launch uh, on Google it. Uh, Department of Commerce has a um, site and you can sign up, you can join in person. It will be at the port building or alternatively it, uh, you can join online and add comment, listen in. But uh, the Clallam EDC will be applying for that grant as a, as a method to work towards the recompete application, which is 20 million and $100 million for federal money. So um, please join us if you're able, that'd be Monday at one. So with that, Susie, thank you so much um, for joining us. And thank you everyone for listening in to Susie's exceptional presentation on what the heck our uh, local community college is doing for us. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks to my team who was here. I appreciate it all. Yeah. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.